Thank you very much, Matt. These are tobacco plants, regarded by many as one of the most lethal killers of the 20th century. But what I want to tell you about today is how possibly through the use of modern biotechnology, we could turn this plant around from a global killer to a global healer to use tobacco plants to manufacture medicines and to address some of the major global issues that we face in health around the world today. Now here in the UK and elsewhere in the developed world, of course, we have access to a huge plethora of medicines and medications against almost every conceivable disease, some of them more useful than others, of course. But if you go global, the stark fact of the matter is that something like 30 to 50% of the world's population don't have access to essential medicines, by which I mean antibiotics, normal medicines for normal diseases, the kind of diseases they get, and vaccines. So I think a fundamental question that we face for the future is how do we start to make medicines available for the poor in developing countries who cannot afford to pay for them? Well, about 20 years ago, a group of scientists started thinking about whether we could use plants to answer some of these questions. Now, of course, we've always used plants to make medications, but this is not the same kind of thing. What we're using here is, this of the, at the time, the new technology of genetic engineering to engineer plants, insert fragments of DNA to ask them to manufacture the medicines specifically that we want to. And we call this field molecular farming. And we regard it as an unprecedented opportunity to make modern medicines economically and at a scale that is relevant for global health. Now, you can make all sorts of medicines using this kind of technology, but what I want to focus on today are these proteins called antibodies. So antibodies are the proteins that our white blood cells normally make in response to infections and other diseases. And they're largely responsible for us getting over our infections and the prevention of future infections. Now, the pharmaceutical industry has already been quite successful in making synthetic antibodies outside of the body. And you may have heard of some of these, like Herceptin, which is used for the treatment of some breast cancers. So the antibodies we have at the moment, there are only a few of them, are currently very successfully used in the treatment of diseases like cancer, some infectious disease, and chronic illnesses like rheumatoid arthritis. The problem is that they're really very expensive. And this picture gives you some idea why. This is how the pharmaceutical industry makes these antibodies at the moment. In the bottom left of the picture are, is a picture of some oyster, uh, um, ovary cells from a Chinese hamster. And these cells are genetically engineered to produce the antibody molecules, and they're grown up in these large stainless steel fermenters or vats. And when you look at this picture, which is of a pharmaceutical production facility, you can see that it's very well controlled, it's pretty clean, probably sterile, and like that famous lager, reassuringly expensive. <laughs> so how would we do that in plants? How would we do something similar in plants? Well, actually, we, regard, we rely on this little bacterium, Agrobacterium tumefaciens. And the gardeners amongst you may well be familiar with this bacterium. It's commonly found in the soil, and it causes this disease in the bottom left panel called crown gall disease, which you commonly see on uh, rose bushes and fruit trees. And it does this by attaching to the plant cell and injecting a small amount of its own DNA, which goes into the plant cell and transforms the DNA within the nucleus of the plant cell and essentially becomes integrated into the plant DNA. Now, back in the 80s, what was realized is that you could disarm agrobacterium remove those genes that it inserts into the plant cell, but replace them with your genes of interest. So in our case, those would be the genes, the DNA, that would encode for the antibodies that we want to produce. So this is what a plant manufacturing facility would look like, and in fact does look like. This is a photograph taken from my friend and collaborator's laboratory in Germany at the Fraunhofer Institute. And this actually is a production crop of tobacco plants that we use to make antibodies. But spot the difference from that stainless steel fermenter picture I showed you earlier. It's not as clean, 
There's no doubt about that. It's not as well controlled. But um, because of that, I think, the pharmaceutical industry and, and the government regulators who control our new drugs have concerns whether we could make antibodies of the same quality that are made from CHO cells. But then also think about the advantages. This is clearly a much cheaper um, investment to make. And the scalability is really limited only by the scale of the greenhouses that you have available to you, not by the size of that stainless steel fermenter. So to address this concern about whether plants could be used to make high-quality antibodies that would match the ones that we already have available, in other words, pharmaceutical-grade antibodies, in the 2000s, we and a number of laboratories around Europe were funded by the EU to ask that specific question. And I'm not going to bore you with the details of this eight-year project. It was a very large piece of work. But I will tell you, at the end of it, we did achieve it. We achieved it to the extent that we persuaded government regulators that the, pro the process that we use to make our antibodies in plants and the final product was at least as good, if not better, than the product that could be made in the Chinese hamster ovary cells in stainless steel. And because of that, they granted us a license to manufacture antibodies in plants, and they also allowed us to move this into a human clinical trial. And I can tell you today that that antibody we produced was safe. And this opens up a huge number of doors for future projects. So what kinds of applications would we like to use these antibodies for? Well, our primary interest has always been in HIV, a developing country, a predominantly developing country disease, mainly in sub-Saharan Africa. And our concept is to produce antibodies in plants and formulate them into a applied in the vagina before sexual intercourse to prevent infection by the virus. So you can see in the bottom left-hand panel here such a gel. It's called a microbicide, microbicide gel. And this is the kind of applicator that we use. And the idea is that a woman would insert the gel before sexual intercourse. And if she encountered the virus, the antibodies in the virus would kill it, kill the virus, before the virus had a chance to enter into the woman's circulation. I like to think of this as a biological condom, because it acts as a barrier to HIV infection. But it needs to be readily available, and it needs to be really cheap. It can't come at too high a cost that would put people off from using it. Unlike a condom, though, it has a couple of other advantages. It empowers women to take control of the prevention of HIV for themselves. And it also allows women to get pregnant whilst protecting themselves against HIV, which is a very important problem. There are other areas in HIV that you use antibodies for. Now, we're particularly interested in this field of preventing mother-to-child transmission. So these would be HIV-positive women uh, and um, trying to stop the transmission of HIV to their unborn child or perhaps their child during delivery. Now, of course, we do have antiretroviral drugs which are currently used for this purpose and actually are very effective. But the problem is that the closer you get to term, to the birth of the child, before starting these antiretrovirals, the less effective they become. Now, we already know that you can use antibodies in pregnant women. We use those for other reasons. And so we just extend this idea, and we're looking at the idea of using HIV antibodies in late presenting pregnant women with HIV to protect their child at childbirth. We're not only interested in HIV. Rabies has been a long-standing interest in my lab at St. George's, and over the last 12 years, we've been trying to develop also antibodies to prevent rabies. So rabies is still a big problem in Southeast Asia and all over Africa, actually. And although we have a really good vaccine against rabies, it's just far too expensive to supply to the whole population. So the standard of care in these places is to wait for somebody to get bitten by a potentially rabid animal, often a dog and therefore often children, to take them to a local clinic or hospital and vaccinate them if the vaccine's available. But also a key component of that care is to give them a product called rabies immunoglobulin, which is essentially antibodies against rabies which have been developed in either horses or humans. 
Again, there's a problem that those antibodies are really expensive. And many times, particularly in Southeast Asia, they're just not given. So we think making a cheaper source of antibodies more readily available would make a real impact on the control of rabies in developing countries. The fourth and last example I'd like to give you of plant antibodies preventing disease is one that may well be well known to many of you. And you will remember last year the outbreak of Ebola infections in West Africa. Now, it'll come as no surprise to you, because this is a, certainly a developing country disease, that there was no vaccine, there was no treatments available for Ebola. So when people went out to help in Sierra Leone or Liberia, like this guy, William Pooley, an NHS nurse, and got infected and became ill, when they came back, there was very few options for treatment. William Pooley was fortunate because at the time there was an experimental drug available called ZMAP, and he was given this drug. So ZMAP turns out to be a cocktail of three antibodies against Ebola that were made in tobacco plants by a small American company. And in this case, there appeared to be a very rapid and surprising recovery. He was one of nine patients treated with ZMAP. Six of them survived. And this has given us great hope that these kinds of antibodies could make a big difference next time there's an outbreak of Ebola. And so for that reason, the US government has poured a lot of money into the development of this product. What they want to do is go into the clinical trials that will formally demonstrate that Ebola antibodies, ZMAP, work and are safe, but also to start stockpiling for the next outbreak. And I want to just give you some idea of what stockpiling or scalability in a plant expression system looks like. So I'm very grateful to a company called Kentucky Bioprocessing, who is manufacturing ZMAP, for sending me this picture. This is a warehouse that they have in Kentucky where they're growing thousands of plants to produce ZMAP antibodies. And you can see that this is not an expensive outfit. This is essentially just a growth, a growth chamber. It just happens to be a very large one. But I would argue that this is the only way that we're going to start making antibodies against these truly developing country diseases, which many other countries, particularly in the developed world, have no interest. So through these examples, I hope I have drawn you into our vision of a new future for tobacco. Changing this plant from a global killer to a global healer. Using tobacco as a plant in the manufacturing sense of the term for modern medicines. And the image in this last slide of mine really makes the final point, because however clever your technology, you're never going to solve the world's problems from a laboratory or even a factory in the developed world. You've got to engage and um, work with people in developing countries where the problems are. So this picture shows you that tobacco is, of course, a, a global crop. There is expertise and technology for growing tobacco all over the world. So this gives a, us a great opportunity to transfer some modern technology, to build industries in the developing, underdeveloped world or the developing countries, to start making medicines which are appropriate for the diseases in that area. That's a concept that we call manufacturing in the region for the region. Thank you very much for your attention.